I saw Witness of Another World. It was really good. It made me weep a lot. Oh, I, I, yeah, I liked it a lot. I thought it was really good. Tonight's guest is Paul Wallace, coming at you live from Australia. Escaping from Eden, does Genesis teach that the human race was created by God or engineered by ETs? How's it going, Paul? Great to have you here. Good day from Australia. We were talking about the documentary Witness of Another World. Have you had a chance to see that? Have you heard of it? Not only have I heard of it, but I interviewed Alan Stiefelman, the writer and director of Witness of Another World, just the other day on the Fifth Kind TV. And we had a long conversation. I love that movie. I love that movie because it's a beautiful story. It's beautifully told. And it really shows the impact on a person of a close encounter. And I think people, when they want to be dismissive of close encounters, they'll sometimes say, oh, here's someone who just wants their 15 minutes of fame. And there's no way you could say that about Juan Perez, the person that the movie's all about. And you see the impact on his life, on his consciousness. And then there's just a beautiful story of closure. And I would recommend it to absolutely anybody. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful movie. Definitely. I could watch it again for sure. It was really, really good. I know there's Watchers and uh, Nephilim and stuff like that, but what what extraterrestrials will be associated with Jesus and like the Lord? <laughs> That's a great question, because I think some people, if they're coming into this territory from, say, a religious start point, often we start off living in a world where we think there's God, there's the devil, there's us, there's angels, there's demons, and there's nothing else. And then once we start understanding, no, there are some other beings living in the universe, we think, oh, goodness, how do these two frameworks match? Uh, and sure enough, I think if you, if you just begin at the beginning and understand that we're looking at a universe with a whole range of beings uh, populating it, uh, it's not hard to see that some might be in closer alliance with God than others. Just looking at the stories of Genesis 1 to 11, you can see stories where some of these other beings are very against humanity. They really just want us to be here as a workforce. And then there are others who care a little bit more about us, who don't want us genocided, who want us to be smart, who want us to have a happy life. And you get further into the Old Testament, and you can see there is a conflict of agendas among all these entities. Now, some of those, I would suggest the more loving ones, the ones who are nicer to humans, are more aligned with God as we understand God. And there may be some who, uh, I mean, like, like spiritual people on earth, who would want to be here as agents of God's will, who would want to be helping. And so I think you've got that whole spectrum of behavior and intention uh, populating the universe. And sometimes humanity gets caught in the middle of that. Definitely. So what do you mean by the title Escaping from Eden? I know you mean Escaping from Eden, but I mean, how does that fit into the story of God casting out Adam and Eve and all that? We read Eden as a story of paradise. And it would be just worth repeating, I guess, that we're reading the latest version uh, of Genesis when we read it. And there's a very broad consensus among scholars that the Old Testament scriptures were given a pretty heavy edit in about the 6th century BCE. And it was probably at that time that all those texts were monotheized that these stories of powerful ones got a bit of an edit so that they all now come across as God stories. But there are hints, even in the current version, that it's not just a simple story of perfection and paradise, and then human beings mess up, and then we're punished and we, we enter the world as we know it. There's a really strange, anomalous verse right at the beginning that points out where the key mineral deposits are near Eden. And then a verse that says that the Elohim put the humans to work. When you get into other ancient narratives, particularly the Sumerian, there is some detail there that would unpack that a little bit. 
and suggest that putting to work doesn't mean a bit of light gardening. There is evidence of prehistoric mining on planet Earth uh, in southern Africa that takes us back at least 200,000 years. That's an interesting time frame because beings that were anatomically identical to us were on planet Earth 200,000 years ago. Evidently, they weren't as intelligent as us. What were they doing? And what are those minds doing there? You put all those together, and I think we begin to consider the possibility maybe Eden wasn't this paradise after all, and maybe being set to work in mines for beings from another planet wasn't that kind of idyllic existence we imagine. So it's with that in the background that I came to the title of Escaping from Eden. The theme of escape really runs through the Old Testament. We escape from Egypt and everything that meant. But there's also an escape from the powerful ones, an escape from the Elohim, which comes in the book of Joshua. Now, our current translation equates Elohim with God, but Joshua doesn't. He says very clearly, today you need to decide who you're going to serve. You're going to serve the powerful ones that Abraham and Sarah's ancestors served in Sumeria. You're going to serve the powerful ones of Egypt. No, as for me and my house, we're going to serve Yahweh and him only. You want to cut the powerful ones off completely. And so there's a theme there of escaping from servitude to powerful ones, powerful ones in Egypt, powerful ones in Sumeria, which was Abraham and Sarah's culture of origin. And so that's the idea of escaping from Eden. But it's obviously a provocative title because in our minds, Eden is beautiful. Why would you want to escape from there? And obviously, you need to pick the book up and read to find out why I would possibly think that. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> we had Linda Godfrey on, and most people tend not to say this, but she brought up a connection with Bigfoot and the Nephilim. There's a lot of people that think these beings are still here, and possibly, you know, they tie them into some of the missing 411 David Polite stuff, you know, all the missing people yep. from the woods and weird stuff oh, like that. Yes. And yes. then there are some more fringe, I mean, uh, some right-wing preacher types who think they're kind of going to all rise up and eat us at some point. The Nephilim are returning. The Nephilim giants are coming back to get us. But uh, as, as far as some of that kind of stuff, what do you think about some of that stuff? Do you think these beings are still here with us on some level? If you'd asked me a couple of years ago about Bigfoot, I, I wouldn't have seen any connection. But now, having researched the book, there's a very interesting narrative from Mesoamerica, from the Mayan tradition, and it's uh, written up in the Popol Vuh. And there's a creation narrative there that has some specifics in it that are really, really intriguing. They match a lot of the specifics in the book of Genesis. Again, the creation begins with a planet that is shrouded in darkness and flooded. Uh, and my belief is because that's describing the planet post-cataclysm. And then these other beings arrive, and it says they orbit the flooded waters, or they, they hover over the waters, and they are having a conversation. How are we going to nurture life on this planet, life in the water, vegetation, animal life, and sentient life? All the same conversations had in, in Genesis chapter 1. And then there comes a point where these entities in the Popol Vuh say, let us make avatars for ourselves to do the work and bring us our food. There's that little hint at what life in Eden might have been about. And so they begin experimenting, trying to create these avatars. That's us, human beings. And in very metaphorical ways, it talks about staged experiments, trying to get the humans intelligent enough to be useful, but not too intelligent, and too conscious so they're going to be difficult to manage. And so the story upgrades us to here, and then we're upgraded to here, and then up to here, and then up to a point where we're a little bit more advanced than we are now, where we have some higher capacities, where we can do things like remote viewing, where we can see things that are extra-dimensional or, or spiritual. 
And they decided, no, it's going to be too hard to manage people who are that bright. So we'll just dial them down a bit. So we get dialed down to the current level. Inhibitors get put in to bring us down. And I must talk about that later because there's real scientific evidence for that kind of timeline in our origins. And then the Popol Vu says, and this is where Bigfoot comes in, that the byproduct of these experiments was us and some of the apes living in the forest. And that is really interesting because here is an ancient, historic, ancestral narrative that relates us to apes centuries before Darwin made that suggestion. And it's quite precise that apes and us came from an earlier source being. Well, that's what contemporary science tells us, that we and apes came from an earlier primate. But it says that the byproduct is us and then some apes living in the forest. Well, uh, it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to say that Bigfoot fits perfectly into that narrative. And there are those who've done research into Bigfoot who have come to the conclusion through various modalities that we are related to Bigfoot, that we were part of the same experiment, that Mayan mythology gives a background to that. So that makes some kind of sense to me. And it also explains why their capacities might be a little different to us. The way they communicate might be a little different to ours. This, this hint at a, a more telepathic communication, that all relates to that Mayan story of having telepathic abilities and then needing to dial us down. So I think that those things really do go together. And then the Anunnaki stuff is about them making like a slave race for gold. And there's some similarities there. Definitely. And I think that does, once you've read the Anunnaki stories, you do read the Eden stories differently after that. And it may be that that wasn't the whole story. Slave species might not have been the whole story because by the time you're reading through the Old Testament, what seems to be happening is you've got various human colonies being ruled over by another kind of entity, uh, the powerful ones. And those powerful ones appear to be in conflict with each other because they'll send the humans to war against each other. So perhaps they're in competition for minerals. Uh, perhaps they've got different agendas for humanity. And you do see more benign agendas for humanity in the text. That first encounter in Genesis 1 verse 2, I believe, is a story of recovery, of beings coming from another place to help the planet recover and nurture intelligent life back into being after some planet-scale disaster. And then there are other more benign interactions as well. When one powerful one decides we're going to genocide the humans, another comes and finds Utnapishtim, a.k.a. Atrahasis, a.k.a. Zusudra, a.k.a. Noah, and says, no, we, we need a rescue plan here. And so you've got a range of agendas for us. Maybe some, all they want is minerals and a slave species, but then some want us to be in a better place than that. And I know one of the themes you have many uh, times mentioned is beings being called an alien and why are they called an alien and they're being our brothers and stuff like that. But one thing I noticed with a lot of people is that they like to, I mean, there are people that make such statements like if you're an alien, you're a demon. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're not human to them. And any kind of an alien is demonic, which I don't agree with that. I mean, surely yeah. some are, some are, but all of them, that's a that's like some burning times kind of <laughs> situation to say that. <laughs> it's like the Spanish, I'll tell them yeah. the, Spanish, the Spanish Inquisition called their hiring. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that kind of thinking really comes from that very locked in universe of God, the devil, angels, demons, human beings, no other kind of entities. So when other entities start appearing, they have to put them in one of those boxes instead of saying there might be some other boxes. 
And then, of course, they say that we're the only life forms that exist on Earth, which seems kind of egotistical to think that we're just it. And uh, I don't believe that either. But I'm also someone that's had a lot of experiences, and so is Wham. I've had a lot of UFO experiences where I've seen strange things over my home, and I've seen some different variety of beings, from light beings to little cloaked beings, and a mm. lot of it centers around when I was 17, I had testicular cancer and went through chemo and then my dad died. So it seemed to be some kind of catharsis there with tragedy. Maybe a shamanic death kind of woke me up to it or something, but that's why, that's why I do the show on many levels is uh, because I've had those experiences. I was trying to figure out what the, what the hell happened. I'm still trying to figure that out. (laughs) You know, so often when people go through trauma, which obviously you did, when you come out of the trauma, and sometimes it's it's just the place you're in mentally after trauma, and sometimes it's because of the things you're doing to recover, you develop a far greater sensitivity. Your shamanic abilities often become very heightened through that. And I've experienced that for myself. You start noticing things that you hadn't noticed before and seeing and hearing things that you hadn't before. And that can relate to an openness to other phenomena, but it also relates to what you're actually perceiving and experiencing. We've had a a lot of uh, shaman authors and stuff. How does that fit into your studies of shamanism? Oh, it's really, really interesting because all the cultures that have produced the ancient narratives that I study in my book, Escaping from Eden, as well as having a story of human origins, and as well as having a story of human origins that involves us being dialed down from a higher level of consciousness, those cultures also have other modalities, spiritual traditions, shamanic traditions that have always aimed at switching those inhibitors off. Uh, allowing us to operate at that higher level of consciousness again. And so the Greeks who had this narrative, they had their kaikion ceremonies as part of the Eleusinian mysteries that were aimed at enabling us to perceive at a higher level of consciousness. You have tea ceremonies in Central America that aim at the same thing, and they had the story of of inhibitors being put in human brains. In Genesis, we've got the story of Babel dialing us down from a a, a higher level. And so I started noticing this correlation of ancient narratives with shamanic traditions and noticing that almost all shamanic traditions are about remember how to perceive, how to develop a greater perceptual field how to do the things we could do before, like remote viewing, like precognition, like modalities in healing. And I think once you start studying the narratives, you have to become very, very interested in the shamanism that goes along with it. Definitely. I found a lot of comfort in studying that subject after what I went through. And of course, Mm -hmm. I was raised Christian in uh, Georgia here in America. That's where I was born in Georgia. I'm in Florida now. But uh, I guess I've and I've always been drawn to reading the Bible. And I mean, it does seem like I mean, there are a lot of UFO things in the Bible. I know there's people that have written whole I know you have, but there's also other people that have written stuff about the scripture, like Ezekiel and the different, like, oh, yes, and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, there are UFOs mentioned in it quite a lot, and there, there's a whole uh, body of literature in the Bible which scholars call apocalyptic literature. And what that really means is that we've got literature that we're not quite sure what it's about. Because the writers have seen something amazing and bizarre, and they know it means something, and they made some connections and realized it it may be about this, this, and this, but it's so bizarre that they give it to us as they saw it, so that we can think about it and try and decode it and work out what's going on. Now, Ezekiel would be one example. When somebody comes to apocalyptic literature who is, um, a, say, a Christian believer, they would tend to read it through a spiritual lens. 
And so they'll pick up on the spiritual and religious themes, and they're certainly there in the text. But what happens if you read that account without any prejudice? And that is really the story of a guy called Josef Blumrich, who was a senior engineer for NASA. He was a project designer for NASA. And uh, he heard Eric von Daniken talking about Ezekiel and saying, oh, this is, uh, this is a close encounter. This is a UFO. And after the talk, Josef Blumerich went to von Daniken and said, uh, you're reading the wrong book. The Bible really isn't about technology. The Bible is about spiritual things. And that encounter, that's really about spiritual things. It's, it's not about technology. And so von Daniken said, um, have you read Ezekiel recently? And Blumerich had to admit he hadn't. He said, well, just go and take a read. So Josef Blumerich goes and reads that text with an engineer's mindset. And so what he comes up with is a viable craft. It's very clear to him that a craft is being described. We're told how it moved, what it looked like, the sound it made, and how it flew from one part of Iraq to another. Ezekiel talks about the experience from his point of view. He's trying to describe the, the glass canopy because he's never seen anything like that before. Describe the noise, never heard anything like that before. He's never flown before. All the time, it's being piloted by someone he describes as being like a human being, which is pretty intriguing. And then it uh, lands him at Tel Aviv. And he says he was so disoriented by the experience, he couldn't speak for seven days. Now, Blumerich said that's, that's a close encounter. That's a, he's been taken aboard a UFO, and he was so convinced that he wrote a book called The Spaceships of Ezekiel. I read Ezekiel. I can't read it any other way. That's, that's what I see in here as well. But so often uh, people come with the prejudice of it's a religious text. It's about religious things. There's some religious things mentioned in the conversation. That's what it's about. And they kind of filter out all the very detailed, techy details that are there in the text. Uh, and that's the most detailed. Another would be uh, Elijah being carried away in a chariot of fire. And again, uh, here's somebody trying to describe what they saw. What is a chariot of fire? What is a whirlwind that comes from the top of the sky down to the ground that you can travel through in, a, in an orderly way? Well, we have other language for that today. Uh, and so I would say, yes. If we're reading with an open mind, there are encounters that, to every intended purpose, would appear to be close encounters and UFO phenomena. What about, uh, I know when I saw that witness of another world and I saw him go up that ladder, I thought of like Jacob's ladder and stuff. I mean, do you think that was UFO stuff where they, there's ladders in the Bible where they climb up and stuff like that? <laughs> That's really intriguing, that, that moment in the movie. The ladder in Genesis is interesting because, again, you read that with a 21st century eye and you've got something that is bringing beings to planet Earth from some other dimension. Now, a ladder doesn't do that, but that is the image that Jacob used to describe what he had seen. And then in the Alan Stiefelman movie where Juan Perez comes to the UFO, and there's a rope ladder for him to climb up. It seems really bizarre, and some people have said, that can't be right. He's eaten too many really fried beans or something. There's no way a UFO would have a rope ladder for you to climb up. But then, once again, you, you've got to understand, here's a 12-year-old boy trying to describe what he experienced, and we all know that our brains often fill in gaps. You know, he got from the ground into the craft. He, he ascended on something. And the language he used when he first described his encounter was that uh, he, he described the UFO as if it were, um, you know, habitation, which is the same word that Ezekiel used to describe his UFO. And so I think you just have to understand there may be a layer of interpretation in the experience. Maybe it wasn't actually a rope ladder that, that got him up, but he got into the craft and he saw something that changed his life. There is an interaction between the phenomenon and our own consciousness, and we have to we have to factor that in. We can't take everything in a, in a fundamentalist way. That with that encounter, just as when we read an ancient text, we need to ask the question: 
what's going on here? What memory is held in this description? Definitely. Well, Wham, anything you'd like to add? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've got a couple of things. The idea that you talk about actually extensively in Chapter 6 of your book, uh, uh, The Great Reemergence. When you're looking at the convergence of evidence for intervention or for um, interaction either, one of the events that you look at very specifically in the book is what appears to be a very interesting sort of boundary, if you will, that occurs uh, between 12,000 and 13,000 years ago, when there appears to have been, at least in much of the Northern Hemisphere, a cataclysm. Uh, It wasn't a cataclysm like some of the cataclysms. It wasn't like the cataclysm that caused the Permian extinction you know it wasn't that quite that mm. big but it was a uh, it was apparently a large enough event that it interrupted potential civilizations that were present at that time and mm. one of the things that comes out of that time period and then i'm talking here about like mainstream archaeologists is that it's not long after that or right after that you have what of course is popularly called the neolithic revolution which is where you have all of these cereal crops just sort of start popping up all over the place and i i used to teach college courses and one of the things i specialized in years ago was world history and and when you do when you when you study world history, you do notice some really interesting and odd patterns. And one of those odd patterns is the emergence of Neolithic cultures relatively simultaneously in very yes. different very different parts of the world. They're so removed from each other that it would be very difficult for diffusion in, in the normal sense to explain it. You know, I wouldn't talk it to my students about that, I would just sort of give them the evidence and they would just see it. You know, they'd be like, whoa, you know, and then of course there, there are other kind of interesting coincidental moments like the Mm. Axis age, which occurs a little bit later. But for our readers without completely destroying their desire to read this chapter, could you talk, (laughs) could you talk a little bit about how you collected the evidence to talk about this moment of reemergence as evidence of an intervention? I think my way into that topic was discovering the research that had been done by the University of Norway and the Max Planck Institute at Karakadag. Uh, And that was a team that went in in 1997, led by Manfred Hoyne, and they found this location where they could identify that 12 naturally occurring plants had been modified to become cultivatable crops. And that in the same location, animal husbandry had begun to be practiced at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, just as an individual case study, that's fascinating. That's absolutely fascinating. It was so localized that Manfred Hoyne said it is possible that we're looking at one tribe or one family who worked out how to do this. And working out how to do this was pretty involved because to turn those naturally occurring plants into crops, you you have to modify uh, two genes, certainly in in the cereal crops, to get Mm -hmm. them working that way. How did they suddenly work out how to do that? And then I was reading that piece of research and uh, you see, I would have been like one of your students where I'd been shown, you know, the timeline for the planet and the timeline for humanity. And here are beings who look like us on the planet for 200,000 years. And then all of a sudden, all around the world, you've got cultivation farms and therefore the beginning of civilization and cities springing up. And you look at it and it really is startling. How did that happen so quickly in so many different places? And you have that thought as a student when you first see it, and then you might forget about it. Well, I Mm -hmm. remembered it when I read the Manfred Hoyne research because I thought here here are two really curious things, a a local discovery that they've pinpointed, and then the question of how does it get from southeast Turkey to Central America, to India, to Africa, to northern Europe, 
just like that. And obviously, the, with the other research I was doing for the book, I was joining some other dots. And I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Cherokee ancestral yes. story of yes. their origins. Yes, because in their story, they have an explanation for that. And I, I don't actually discuss this, the Cherokee storyline in the book, but their, their story is a beautiful story of people coming in their prehistoric past to them, and they say where they came from, and that they came down in craft that looked like eggs, and then they got out of those and they taught the people how to farm. They taught them about hygiene. They taught about how to live as a civilization. And as soon as you hear that story, if you're willing to give that credit, well, there's a possible explanation for how this knowledge could suddenly happen in Southeast Turkey and then all around the planet. It's not happening because that family are taking holidays in different places and sharing their knowledge along the way. There is something, some other external agency that is assisting us in that moment, it seems to me. I don't go into the Cherokee story, but I do go in back into the book of Genesis to say, here are the evidences. And you're very right. It happens at a really, really interesting moment because it looks like humanity is being assisted in the aftermath of the Younger Dryas Cold Period. And the timing of that is interesting because we do have what appear to be the vestiges of stone-built cities now underwater that would have been above water no more recently than 10,000 years ago. And what that suggests is that in that period, 10,000 years ago, when Karakadag is, is happening, you've got a pivot in our story. There's an old civilization that's gone, that's now submerged, and there's a new civilization being nurtured back into being. And I think that's, I think that's the story. And I think there are many clues in Genesis that we've had that kind of interaction with other beings and that a number of memories of those interventions are held in the Bible and in so many of the world's mythologies. And this then leads to sort of a, a much larger question that, that to me are, is kind of like the implications of this, because in some interesting way, um, like you say, it would seem that if you were like looking at all of these different narratives, you would, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to be able to, to, to tell how they're similar, you know, in some ways. I yeah. mean, even, even with their differences, um, they're, they're, they are quite similar in terms of themes and, and sometimes down to really specific stuff. I was participating in an interview a couple of weeks ago, and we were both talking about some really cool stories from Northern Europe that have like really specific like bits of information, like how to use raven feathers in order to um, induce truth telling in someone. Uh, truth telling that will induce healing and and I ran across almost the exact i mean almost word for word exact procedure in an ancient Iranian text, and I was just like, okay, <laughs> we were talking about the relationships between animals and humans, and how mm. um how in in all of these indigenous texts, animals are often. Um, either the instruments of these messengers or they are their, these the messengers themselves. There's this implication that humans have a very different relationship with animals at one time than we currently have. And of course, that basically implies a lot about how our consciousness has changed. So um, the question then is, why do you think just out of curiosity, why do you think, in a fascinating way, all of this kind of stuff, um, this information that that you've been researching, which obviously was part of a spiritual quest or project uh, in mm. your life, do you think that this is part uh, that that the coming together of all this information now, both scientific? And what some people would call fringe science, but it turns out that it intersects with mainstream science in all kinds of ways. 
What is this implying about what might be going on in terms of the evolution of humanity once again, facing as we are, our potential disasters coming up? <laughs> well, that's that's a huge question. Could, yeah, I know. I know. You, but but can you when focus I, that a little bit for me? Give me well, a start. And, well, well, in other words, when I when I read through your book, and I admit I read it quickly, but when I read through your book, I thought to myself, okay, so we're talking about the past here, but obviously, you know, in order to talk about the present, in order to talk about a different way of understanding our origins. Because, I mean, I don't know if, if you feel this way, but I certainly feel this way, um, that, that, that the planet and humanity itself as part of the planet is going through or is preparing to go through another series of potential crises, maybe in this case, yes. sort of brought on by ourselves. But at yeah. the same time, you know, the, the reports of strange experiences, of paranormal experiences, UFO experiences, all of these things are proliferating very yes. rapidly. And some of, you know, some of it is probably crazy, but a lot of it isn't. Uh, so in other words, what do these stories imply about what might, what might be happening yeah. now and what where might we're happen? Heading. Sure, where we're yeah. heading. Yeah. Uh, I agree that there's, there's definitely a momentum building in terms of disclosure and awareness. It seems to me that there have been policy changes in governments around the world so that we're in a soft disclosure period where more mm -hmm. and more people are getting the idea that actually there's another presence here on planet Earth, that we are already in contact with other species. And where, where does that lead us? My hope is that we will get to a place that has to do with our own consciousness and that has to do with our technology. The appetite I came away with, having done the research and produced Escaping from Eden, was particularly focused on remembering how to operate at a higher level of consciousness, turning the inhibitors off, to use that language. And that's language, by the way, I get from science, not from mythologies. That's mm -hmm. from the study of, of acquired savant syndrome and understanding that we can operate at a better way, a more conscious way, a more intelligent way, that that might have a very big impact on how we live together as people. And then the technological side is, if we get to a point of disclosure, that has huge implications for us technologically. It potentially would totally alter our dependence on uh, oil for instance, uh, mm -hmm. the, whole, the whole world economy would change as a result of that. What if we all had access to free power? What, I mean, that would make a huge difference to people living in my part of the world where, where they cannot afford to live in their own homes because of power bills. I mean, that's putting it at a very simple nuts and bolts level. But what if we came into a different place technologically as a species and a different place in terms of our consciousness? Could we not then live on the planet in a far more healthy and beneficial way, one that isn't sabotaging the planet beneath our feet, and one that might equip us to deal with the vulnerabilities of living on a planet that's hurtling through space when we might collide with things. And I believe there's some evidence that some of the presence of other species in contact with us has to do with our survival has mm -hmm. to do with making sure we don't accidentally nuke ourselves to death or that right. we're not prepared to come together and deal with an external threat to the planet. So I'm, I'm hopeful for those reasons because I think we, we are getting help. We are getting support on those things. But I would just love to see the awareness reach the point where we're all on the same page and where we can all begin unpacking the implications for consciousness, living together, and living technologically and in harmony with the planet. That's a huge aspiration, but the place I would hope my book can play in that is just the building of that awareness, the bursting of these bubbles that suddenly has people realizing that we're occupying a more populated planet and universe than we thought. And there's something going on that it might be helpful for us all to be in on. 
Right. Well, and that we're at, we're also not only we occupying a more populated planet, but the planet itself is a person working out some of its stuff too, you know, so we're part of whatever that is. Um, Do you know, it's, it's so interesting, Wan, that you use that language because I have been amazed as I've probed the work of Plato to realize how long-standing that language and that concept is that the material universe exists in order to host consciousness and that it pervades everything. It pervades space, it pervades energy, matter, the unifying field, the planet, us. Potentially your whole experience of life changes if you can take that idea on board. It's not a new idea. It's not a 1960s or a new age idea. This is Plato who really is at the heart of the whole of Western thought. And it's another moment where I think, hang on, why isn't that the mainstream narrative? Why is that a new thought for so many of us when it was there two and a half thousand years ago, along with other ideas that we really have taken on board? And I think that that looking for unity and consciousness is, is very powerful. And I've always felt what you were saying earlier, that in a time long past, our relationship with other creatures was different, our relationship with plants, our relationship with animals. And as soon as you begin thinking in terms of the whole material universe existing for consciousness, you start relating to animals and plants differently, and you look for different things, and you listen for different things. It's, it's really quite powerful. Well, and, and then you, you realize that natives here talk about this all the time, as, as do other indigenous people. I know certainly the aborigines in Australia do. Everything is consciousness. Everything is an expression of that. And so yes. you, have to, you have to take seriously what's being presented to you, you know, and this is why, you know, a, a raven isn't just a bird in a tree. A raven is, is a being, and is and not only is a being, but is an expression of being, just as you are. I'm one of these people that have way too much liberal arts in my background, but I uh, I have a I have a you degree. Can't have too much. Well, you I agree. Have- I agree. But I drive people crazy. Um, <laughs> but um, I too read Plato, and uh, I always thought that there's been like this huge misinterpretation of Plato. The thing that in the West has tended to be emphasized has been, you know, this notion that Plato was a dualist. And when I read him, I didn't see that. In fact, I was able to read him a little in the Greek, and I didn't see that. What I saw was him trying to figure out a way by which to explain, using the metaphors and everything that he had at his disposal, to explain why it is that we experience this dualism, which is different than promoting dualism. You know, why is it that, you know, we have an ideal about something and then when we go to actually create it, there's sort of like, there seems a lot of times to be like a lag in it. You know, it doesn't quite, it doesn't always turn out exactly how our our, our mind. And so he's trying to explain that phenomenon. Uh, He obviously knows that those two things are connected he never says that the material world's a bad place. I mean, that he never says oh. that. It, it's just not there. And I think that and, a lot of the West has really suffered under this, this delusion about what Plato was actually saying. I agree. And in fact, those dualisms he talks about, they're right at the beginning of his thought processes, aren't mm-hmm. they? Right. That's, that's his start point. Right. Uh, to give us a framework, to give us a handle, to make a journey by the time we've made the journey with him, we're in a far more sophisticated and layered reality than, you know, just A or B. It's not right. a binary world he's talking about at all. Right. I mean, because what he's basically saying is, you know, we experience these binaries, you know, you, you, you know, we experience, you know, hot and cold. And, and he's, he's actually just sort of giving you the tools by which you can kind of begin to see how those things are actually just aspects of something else. <laughs> and yes, yes, they're, aspe- right. they're aspects of each other, basically, is what they are. I've not ever been nearly as frustrated with Plato as I have been by, you know, like, for example, the way the church used Plato, <laughs> the way, the yeah. way, the way, the way um, Augustine used Plotinus, who had done something else with Plato, you know, but. Well, Plato it, played a really positive role in the early years of Christianity. 
and uh, and then he kind of got edited out uh, mm -hmm. because there were very significant church fathers who were great fans of Plato and affirmers right. of, of his work and his thought. And, of course, it's worth noting, we say Plato. I mean, Plato's intention was really to to bring us the best of international thought and and express it for us. And he he points to sources that, that he's lent on in, in his learning. You know, he refers to ancestral memory, particularly Egyptian ancestral memory. But his contribution was really taken on board very seriously by people like Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Clement, Clement, uh, yes, yes, Clement. Isn't he Clement, wonderful? Clement is wonderful. <laughs> Isn't he yes. wonderful? Yes, he's and wonderful. People look at that and they say, oh, all right, okay, well, that's not so surprising because Plato was very popular at the time, so obviously it has some fans in the church. But they don't seem to join the dots and realize that when those church fathers affirmed Plato, they were affirming a completely different narrative of origins to the one that has become the mainstream narrative in Christianity. Plato talked about other agencies involved in the emergence of the universe and in the nurturing of Homo sapiens. He talked about the demiurge, the craftsman. He talked about children of God who came and intervened in human development to make us more conscious and more intelligent. And these church fathers saw no conflict, evidently, between that and their reading of Genesis. Mm -hmm. And they saw no conflict because they regarded those stories in Genesis 1 to 11 as not being God's stories. They read that word Elohim differently, and they saw it as, as a restatement of what Plato was saying. Right. Uh, but then the church has this big debate about whether the Hebrew scriptures are going to be glued on to the apostolic writings to make a Christian Bible. And if they do that, then they're endorsing the latest edit that has all those as God's stories. Yes. And so built into all those discussions, you've got an alternative view of a much more populated universe, a much more interesting story of origins, a much more beautiful image of God, which I believe is on the Plato side of the Church Fathers. And then you've got the other side, which is actually more favorable to, I would say, managing people and controlling them. Mm. Uh, and that was the mm. one that got favored. And then these other church fathers, a lot of them, ended up getting excommunicated and edited, their works edited, so that all that idea from Plato gets pushed to one side. And we're now in a world of uh, one God, and you can't question his moral behavior because you've included stories that include genocides and <laughs> right, uh, right. agendas against human beings. All that now becomes God's story instead of story of other entities. And that becomes the story from 144 AD right through until 2009 when Pope Benedict says, let's have another think about this. Let's put these things back on the table because all that goes back on the table with that colloquium that happened. So Plato still remained a, a strong influence. And you're right, Augustine uh, appeals to him. But his really important contribution gets excised from Christianity and excised from Western and some Eastern thought as well as a consequence. Yes. Well, as part of this discussion, I, can I tell you just a very brief story? And then I have the question sure. for you. And this, okay. is just, is, and this is just so that you know that these narratives that in a sense have been suppressed and secreted, because hmm. many of those church fathers' writings have survived somewhere. You know, the, the Eastern Church kept some of them and some of them have yes. just simply, simply survived. But there are other places where they have too. My own spiritual path is Sufism. I've been a Sufi for over 25 years. When I first sat to receive my initial initiation um, in front of the peer that was going to initiate me, uh, it, it was apparently, and I didn't know this at the time, but it was apparently his tradition to sit in meditation and then in a kind of a, uh, it, it's sort of a, an Eastern way to do it, but they do this in a lot of Sufi traditions. Uh, they, they give you a story. A story for a deep story from the tradition that is intended to um, be your story that opens you up 
uh, that you sort of live with the story. But it's from the tradition. It isn't just like made up. You know what I mean? The story that he told me was a story that um, he apparently only told to a few people. I found out later. But what this story was, was basically a very shortened version of what we've been talking about, that at the core of human spiritual and uh, spiritual development and, and, and psychological and physical development, there, there was a conflict between larger forces, larger beings uh, that were off planet. He basically told me a version of the whole thing we've been talking about. And the reason he was telling me this, he said, was because he said, there is an element of your soul that is connected to that original conflict. And so it's very important that you do and not do certain things for yourself so that you don't get caught up in that conflict again. Because part of the next stage of human development is being able to integrate the elements of that conflict and rising above it to a new form of consciousness. This is what he told me. Now, I, I, it kind of blew my mind because I didn't expect to be listening to about a, a story about ETs and yes. a war in a Sufi in a Sufi meditation. All right, but apparently this is a deep internal story that is carried by some of the orders. And, and is just transmitted orally at certain times to certain people. And so what the first thing I wanted to say to you, of course, is that the story is known in other places. The other thing is, is that he said it's, it's very important that you are circumspect with whom you share the story with because, you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, because we're talking about all kinds of things. Especially if you want a job. Oh, well, Exactly. <laughs> You point out in the beginning part of your book, you know, some of the fundamentalist tendencies of some folks. You have to just be careful with that. But so, so, so now that you're in the process of putting these things together, what has been the response of various members since you are a you are a minister? Uh, (laughs) And so, what has been the response to some of what you've been doing, and what would you like the response to be? I've been really excited by the response uh, to this point. And it's funny because my book doesn't hit the shelves until May the 1st, 2020. But the material of my book is getting out there through the Paul Wallace channel, the Fifth Kind TV, through interviews like this one. Mm -hmm. And often I get to engage with comments of complete strangers who are hearing and responding. One of the loveliest responses I get is from people who say, This is such a huge relief because I've always felt this or because I've read the scriptures and seen this and I haven't found anyone else who has been able to see or hear what I'm saying because it's outside of their box and I've been made to feel like some kind of (laughs) crazy person. But this makes sense or this makes sense of things I've been struggling with personally. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in a place where I'm actually excited about learning more of what the reality is. And it is, for them, like taking the red pill in the Matrix, except it, in a nicer way. It brings you out into, into a better, a more exciting place. I love hearing those responses, and they come from people of many different kinds of backgrounds, but often it's from believers who are in faith communities wherein this has not been part of the narrative. And it's mm-hmm. just a wonderful affirmation and relief for those people. And then some will hear what I'm saying and say, hang on, this can't be right because it contradicts these beliefs I hold. And they might come back very angrily and say, "Uh, this is blasphemy. You're clearly wrong. Go and read the Bible and you'll see that what I'm saying is right. And then they'll say what they think. And, And some of those responses can be very angry. And then I go back and say, oh, thank you so much for your email. (laughs) Thank you so much for your comment. The reason I'm saying that is this. Uh, Just take it a step back and show how I've got to where I've got. And with a lot of people, that's all it takes them to come back and say, well, I'm sorry I was so aggressive because I I see what you're saying now. And Mm -hmm. they're now beginning to go on a bit of a journey themselves. And I'm really encouraged at how little it takes For some people to get from that, I'm inside my box and I'm angry with anyone who's outside it, 
to, hang on, this is a journey I think I might need to make as well. And it's beginning to make some sense of things I've been thinking. I love hearing that because it can look like people are really, really entrenched in their already held conclusions and in the boxes in which they live. And some may be, but I think a lot of people aren't. A lot of people have experienced more than they might have been able to express before. And so I just love it when my book, Escaping from Eden, or one of my documentaries does that for someone, just bursts that bubble. And now all of a sudden we're having a conversation about some real stuff. And the other thing that I feel really privileged about is as soon as people hear the kind of things we've been talking about and they realize, oh, there's actually some merit to this, there's some coherence to this, they will come to me with stories of their own experiences Mm -hmm. that they have never been able to share before. Uh, Just yesterday, I had a guy in his late 60s who has had a series of close encounters through his life. He had one friend who was there for one experience with him. And other than that, he's talked to his wife about it. It started when he was a child, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, about five years old. Mm -hmm. And in all that time, he's not found anyone else to tell what happened other than his wife and the friend who was there for one. And now he's talking to me about it. And numbers of people come to me in that way because they think here's someone who will actually listen to what I've experienced and will be able to listen without judgment. And I'm so excited by that because there's such a need for that. People who've had experiences that are not part of the mainstream narrative can be, and the Alan Stevelman movie illustrates this so powerfully, can Mm -hmm. become so isolated and so hurt and traumatized even by the response of the world around them to what they've experienced that they get locked up. It can be really damaging. And so for me to be one of the people who they can go to and say, I I have a story I really need to tell is just a beautiful and a wonderful privilege. And I think (laughs) before too many months go by, I will realize how widespread these experiences really are, that we're living in a culture full of experience of ET contact, but where those stories are not being told. Oh, yeah, I agree with you there. I mean, I research uh, here in the Hudson Valley, and, you know, the Hudson Valley is sort of known for a wide range of experiences. And whenever I do any kind of presentation or interview or anything, inevitably, there are people that come up and they have a UFO experience or a ghost experience or something, you know, something that has fundamentally transformed their life in some way, sometimes for the good and sometimes not. It depends on, you know, Mm. how they were able to integrate it or who they were able to tell or what it was, you know. Um, And, but these, these experiences fundamentally have changed their understanding of themselves and the world, uh, even in ways that they don't really quite know. But the point is, is that they need to tell somebody it's really important for them to tell somebody for someone to be able to, to sit there and just take their story. And, and after I've been doing this for years now, it's like, we finally learned the right questions to ask and, and how to listen. And, Sometimes that's all they need. They just need to know that they're not crazy. That's exactly right. So this is sort of like, a, maybe this is like a new interesting turn for your ministry. It really is. I love the contact that my book is giving me with such an amazing diversity of people all around the world. But also because I've come into it through the route I've taken, which is the study of the past, the study of ancient narratives, I feel I've got a bit of a grounding when I get into conversation with people about experiences that may be quite new to me and that we may be interpreting these things together. Yeah, I think, I mean, just just the way you've described it, you've got the good background, you know, you've got the scholarly background um, and you've got the you've got the people background. So you're all you're, you're all set up. <laughs> <laughs> and also, that's right. And the work of a, a preacher really, I think at its best, is is to share the journey. You know, you're carrying people's questions, you, you take them to your sacred texts, whatever your faith community might be, and you share the journey and the journey of, of personal growth as well. And I think that really that's what my book is about. 
and what this next phase of my ministry is about, sharing this journey that takes us into a more populated universe and all the therefores that flow from that. And and how does this change how does this change the the narrative of good and evil? Oh, that's a really fascinating question. The narrative of good and evil is now this might offend some people is really distorted in the current redaction of the Bible because we've got the character of God doing atrocious things, which we're not supposed to question. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think there are real major, major moral problems sewn in to mainstream Christianity because of what we've done with the Bible. So it's not like you go from a really crystal clear picture of good and evil in Orthodox Christianity, and then you've got to scratch around for another framework. It's not that way at all. As soon as you start reading the Bible with a plural Elohim and realize these are stories about what the Sumerians called sky beings or what Genesis calls the powerful ones, you begin to evaluate the moral behavior of those beings in a way you never have before. And you say, wait a minute, that agenda is really anti-human. And I suppose for me, that is the bedrock of my framework now. What is pro-human? What is anti-human? What is pro-love? What is anti-love? And I think that the moral grid I have of good and evil makes more sense with this new narrative, new to me, than the old one of let's read Adam and Eve and everything fundamentalistically. So when you're talking about good and evil, um, like anti, anti-human, anti or, or pro-human, and are you actually talking more about a pro-human being like pro-life, pro-unity? Pro connection with uh, kind of a larger sense of what consciousness means. Pro growth rather than pro narrowing. I mean, is am I yes. using words correctly here? Very much so. And it's just interesting how, with the reading of the Bible that has excluded the powerful ones and turned it all into God stories, it frames our life as a life of either obedience or disobedience. Uh, and that becomes our framework of, of good and evil. And we think of mm-hmm. that in human terms and then for spiritual beings as well. And then by the time we're reading Jesus, we're reading it all as obedience versus disobedience. And and then we listen to Jesus' teachings as, as if it's all about how to enable us to do the right thing and not do the wrong thing and do the good thing, not the sinful thing. And once you take that that framework away and reread the Old Testament in this more, more plural way, you come back to Jesus' teachings and you realize that binary framework doesn't really do his teachings justice at all. Mm-mm. His teachings are far more interesting and layered and expansive than that and would appear to be far more about how we can be a healthy society and healthy people and living in ways that aren't self-destructive or destructive to others. And that's a different framework to the the binary good, bad, evil, good, sinful, not sinful. Uh, so it's a more, I, I think it's a more open and a more useful <laughs> uh, view. <laughs> I'm hearing a a, a very interesting uh, book on practical theology in your future. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> Definitely, I, uh, Paul. I enjoy your openness. It's uh, you know, there's not many people that you can be so open when you discuss Christianity. And I, I had a father who was a preacher and grew up in Georgia with Christianity. And I guess, you know, I believe, but I also struggle with humanity. Like, I mean, like the way, you know, humanity, like there are parts of it that say they're Christian, but then they do crazy, terrible things. Like, let's say Waco or uh, Hitler or the Crusades, the burning times. And then, of course, now in America, you have the Trump situation. It's like a weird cult. We don't know how that's going to end. It's terrifying. They think he's orange Moses and he doesn't do anything really to help 
anybody that supports yeah. him except i'm gonna build a wall he doesn't do insurance he doesn't feed them he doesn't i mean that's the parts of christianity that i guess i struggle with is when the people get so off track and i guess you maybe it's evil beings doing it to them i don't know or separation from god but it yeah go ahead yeah, i i agree uh, but you see i really think we created the pathway to all the things you've just described when back in the beginning of Christianity, we glued the current edit of the Hebrew scriptures to the apostolic Jesus. writings, and that meant that you included a story like Abraham nearly sacrificing his son Isaac and reading that as God told him to do it. He didn't question it. He was willing to kill his own son because God told him. And, he, and that's given us as an example of faith. My reading of it now is there are two different kinds of being in that story. There's the powerful ones who tell Abraham to kill his son, and then there's a messenger from Yahweh who says, don't do it, and comes to the rescue. But when the editor turns that into a God story and says, oh, God told Abraham to do it, and Abraham was about to kill his son until he stopped him, now you've created a God who cannot be questioned, whose morality cannot be challenged. And therefore, you don't challenge the morality of people who speak for God. And you can draw a straight line from that to all the kind of phenomena you were just describing, where Christians are willing to do abominable things because they think they're doing it in the name of God, and we don't question God's morality. This is one of the reasons why I am so feel so urgently about getting my book out, because we have to say that is not the right reading of that story. That is not a God story. That is not what God is like. God is better than that and uh, set us free from slavery to dark forces that would get human beings to behave in that way. We need to unravel that story, because all that monstrous behavior you just described is undergirded by this wrong, distorted theology of God that got written in all the way back. And that's why we need to put some of these questions back on the table. Are these God stories or are they stories about something else? And they Definitely. are about something else. Well, we appreciate it so much. What's your website and where's the best place to get your book? Uh, Amazon? Go to Amazon. You can pre-order Escaping from Eden. And the subtitle is, Does Genesis teach that the human race was created by God or engineered by ETs. You can pre-order it at a good price. It won't hit the shelves till May the 1st, 2020, but uh, it will hit the shelves healthily uh, if lots of people pre-order it. And there'll be material in the meantime on the Paul Wallace channel on YouTube and the Fifth Kind TV on YouTube. And you can find everything you need to know on my website, which is Paul Anthony Wallace, Anthony with an H, Wallace with an I-S, dot com. We appreciate it so much. It's great to get into your your mind and dance with your spirit. Thanks so well, much. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you, Wam. It's been a Thank wonderful you. conversation. Thank really you. enjoyed it. Yes, Thank it's you. wonderful. Ha have, a, have a lovely day. We're going to go to bed. <laughs> All right, then you have a lovely sleep, and maybe we'll talk again sometime. <laughs> All right. Keep, keep All right. us in your prayers. Take care. <laughs> <We'll do. laughs> Good Thank night. You. Good night. Uh, all right, everybody, listen to United Public Radio 107.7 FM New Orleans. Hopefully, uh, Trumple Gooch doesn't blow us up this weekend. Everybody have a good weekend. <laughs> good night. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>